Welcome everybody, because this is a, a fun venue and avenue for us to educate ourselves and our patients and be involved in this really crazy time. So I'm going to give a few updates about COVID-19 and some recommendations. I'm going to introduce the concept of uh, sports cardiology and what that means, um, as you can recognize from the logo in the top left hand corner. We're going to address some of the vulnerabilities and the risk factors that are involved in cardiovascular disease. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we talk about uh, too much exercise, too little exercise, what we call about the dose response curve. Um, we're going to talk about exercise, the benefits, and give some examples. And then the uh, favorite part of the session is uh, answering questions from patients. Now we do have some questions that have already been submitted. So I have those and then uh, we will go through that at the end and Dr. Lewis will help to moderate that. And then we'll wrap up, have some conclusions and recommendations. So let's get started. So COVID-19 is a local a national and a global pandemic. You've all heard a lot about this. So dealing effectively with such a crisis requires accurate, consistent messaging and leadership. So where you get your information is critically important. And do you trust the information you're receiving? I'm talking to a situation recently that's come up about the CDC guidelines and school reopening. So the uh, just days ago, CDC revised its guidelines for reopening after the president attacked its initial recommendations. Then the pediatricians in the country, that's my phone, that's normal. Um, the, the pediatricians in this country uh, walk back support for in-person school. The education secretary won't say if schools should listen to the CDC guidelines on reopening. Florida publicly discloses hospitalizations as the US breaks another case record, which probably meant that they weren't disclosing hospitalizations. Uh, the, the governor of Florida, he defends the state reopening as Dr. Fauci says, states probably reopened too quickly. The most dishonest, biased news coverage of our lifetime, and it's about to get worse. So what's really going on in, in Massachusetts? And, and this has been an incredible story for us uh, locally. And I know there's some people on this call from other parts of the country. Um, the beginning of COVID, new reported cases started slowly in Massachusetts and spiked towards the end of uh, April and uh, beginning of May. And then slowly we saw that curve flatten and come down. And this is where we are currently in Massachusetts. The seven day average is really low. Corresponding to that, not just about cases and testing, but you can see deaths. And this is also in May with the height, and this is currently in July. So what does that mean? So uh, compared to April 15th, and this was just yesterday's numbers, the uh, seven day average positive test rate has declined by 94% in our state. Uh, patients in hospital has declined by 84%. The numbers of hospitals surge capacity, these are really good numbers, less than 90% uh, down from uh, April and deaths down 95%. This is not what's happening in the rest of the country. So yesterday, uh, New York Times just showed the uh, new cases uh, and you can see April and we were part of that surge in Massachusetts and then we came down and then everything started reopening and this is where we are now. New cases in this country, 135,000 deaths as of yesterday. So COVID is real. If we all act together and help each other, we can dramatically limit the spread, reduce deaths and protect our hospitals. And remember that anyone can get COVID and anyone can become very sick. Those who are seriously ill can take a long time to recover. So even if you are not at high risk for severe illness, your actions can create risk for others. 
So hopefully a viable vaccine is available sooner than later. In the meantime, it's our priority to decrease baseline health vulnerabilities. And that's what this talk is about. We are aware of the risk factors that are coincident to cardiovascular disease and being more vulnerable to serious COVID-19 infections. Healthcare disparities have been exposed and amplified and we all need to work towards improving all factors that increase risk, including these disparities in our society. This is data from yesterday, and I don't know if anyone saw the news, but this was published, uh, I saw it in the New England Journal yesterday, New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and this was the first uh, vaccine data that was published, and it was a combination of Moderna, uh, a, a biotech company, and the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, which Dr. Fauci heads. And this showed that uh, in 45 patients, the uh, vaccine, which was given in two separate doses at three different uh, dose, uh, doses for patients, was safe. There were very few uh, serious reactions. And so this is now uh, inspiring people and giving them confidence that the vaccine is almost ready to be tested. So managing yourself during this period requires consistency and endurance. And here's the uh, metaphor with exercise. Think of this as a marathon rather than a sprint. So we all know it's imperative to be physically active, but we also have to be cautious how we feel. The food we eat matters. And we've had several discussions and uh, lectures about uh, nutrition. We've heard many inspiring and creative stories from our patients how they've managed through this difficult time, and it's truly been inspiring for us as clinicians. Some people have thrived, others have been crippled. Many have had an opportunity to reflect, take time out, recognize what's important, reprioritize and reconnect with the people around you and who are important to you. And we really want to emphasize this, the importance of connection and relationships. Social isolation in itself is a risk factor. So figuring out how to physically distance, yet socially stay connected. I'm going to introduce this concept of sports cardiology because this is something we've been doing at the Lown Group for the last five years. The American College of Cardiology started sports cardiology as a division, recognizing the importance of uh, this as a subspecialty within cardiovascular disease. So what we do is we evaluate athletes of all ages with known or suspected or risk factors for heart disease who seek to safely participate in sports. So what is the definition of an athlete? So this is truly anyone who places a precedent in physical activity. And it includes high school, college, recreational athletes, professional athletes, master athletes, and the tactical athletes. So what's a tactical athlete? A new definition. Uh, tactical athletes are people who in the line of work have to be physically fit. First responders, firefighters, uh, police, uh, military. So we aim to improve health, resilience, and productivity of all of these athletes. We also are able to evaluate and advise athletes seeking to optimize performance. We do certain monitoring, we do VO2 max testing, aerobic thresholds, and we've developed a program for high school and college athletes who have required screening or clearance to return to play. And this is a whole new area now with sports and return to play and what is safe in the era of COVID. We review risks, we promote uh, preventive strategies, and we aim to improve performance. So why sports cardiology? Well, athletes present unique challenges, as you can imagine. Athletes tend to push themselves beyond normal physiologic barriers. There are changes that exercise caused to the heart, what we call adaptation or remodeling. And sometimes this can look very similar to disease. And we also are, uh, it's really important to screen and risk stratify athletes and understand the pitfalls of what these screening tests may be. And that uh, recognizing that traditional medical testing for non-athletes and interpretation of those tests may need to be modified for athletes. 
So uh, the Bethesda conference uh, in 2015, we stratified what the types of sports and physical activities are. And in this uh, particular graph, it looks at high dynamic component exercise. And on this axis, the increasing static or strength components of exercise. So uh, low dynamic, low static are uh, exercises like bowling and cricket and curling golf, unfortunately, I'm sorry. Uh, whereas the high dynamic are those are uh, kayaking, cycling, decathlons, triathlons, rowing. So we need to know the demands of the athlete sport to recognize what to uh, expect and, and depending on their, uh, whether they're in high school, collegiate or elite professional masters athletes. So this is important, why? Well, we want to prevent death and uh, we assess risk of death by age and partly the division seems to occur at age 35 so under the age of 35 years old if you're going to die from a sport or physical activity um, it tends to be a genetic predisposition what we call hypertrophic myopathy that's a thick heart muscle that you're born with and sometimes athletic remodeling can look like hypertrophic myopathy whereas coronary artery disease occurs in the minority over the age of 35 most people who die uh, exercising or in an athletic environment tend to have underlying coronary artery disease so uh, Sudden death and adverse uh, events in athletes are very rare, but they make headlines. And uh, just uh, as an example, a professional hockey player who collapsed uh, in February 2020 this year before the season stopped, um, he collapsed and he had a genetic abnormality or a thickened heart muscle. And uh, fortunately, because of the environment he was in and was witnessed, he was able to be resuscitated. So we use certain tools to assess our athletes and in our office we use a metabolic cart and uh, we, I'm sure some of you have heard of cardiopulmonary stress testing or CPETs. We do VO2 max testing and we can do this on a treadmill, we can do it on a bicycle, we can do it on a rowing machine. Um, we get important data about heart rate effects of exercise, what's uh, the VO2 max zones and uh, the different types of training zones and heart rate zones. So we can uh, give people certain information as to, you know, what, what levels of heart rate and monitoring uh, they need to train at. Many of our athletes have wearable devices. Um, this is an example of uh, EKGs, and then there's a lot of medical devices, which tend to be a lot more reliable. This is a mobile cardiac telemetry device that we use on our patients, and we uh, can set people up on these. We, we, in fact, during COVID, we've been able to uh, do non-contact delivery of this device, and we can real-time through the cellular service see what's happening to people's heart rhythms. And then there's, a, again, a lot of wearables. So there's a big discrepancy in, in, uh, between the, what's, what's commercially available and what's medically, uh, what is medical-grade equipment. We can also use uh, certain tests uh, to evaluate athletes um, and many of our patients have been through some of these tests. Um, this is an echocardiogram or a cardiac ultrasound um, and this assesses the heart muscle function, the thickening of the heart muscle, how well it squeezes. We can also measure pressures through the heart um, and the flow through valves. This is a mitral valve. This is a heart, left ventricle, which is pumping beautifully. And this is a MRI on the right hand. We do cardiac MRIs to assess heart muscle function, as well as inflammation in heart muscle. And advanced cardiac imaging tools have been used uh, very successfully in uh, the assessing people with um, COVID heart disease as well. So uh, this is a coronary angiogram. This is a uh, um, catheter we put into the heart muscle and we uh, inject contrast material through the blood vessels that supply oxygenated blood to the heart muscle. And this is a, a, of a patient who had a sudden death event, but had normal coronary arteries. 
um, but had a very abnormal right ventricle, um, which we call arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, and this is on his MRI. Want to move on to vulnerabilities and cardiovascular risk. So in the setting of COVID, uh, the CDC have provided guidelines of those people who are in, at increased risk. And this is very similar to what we already know about other non-communicable or chronic diseases. So chronic kidney disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, emphysema, bronchitis, anyone who's in an in, immunocompromised state or has a weakened immune system. Obesity, this is a huge issue. Uh, body mass index greater than 30. Um, serious heart conditions, heart failure, coronary artery disease, cardiomyopathy, sickle cell disease, which is an abnormality of the blood cells. Uh, and th there seems to be a high predilection for serious uh, uh, disease from COVID-19 and people with diabetes. So when we've been treating coronary artery disease, historically, um, if you look from the 1950s to more recently to the 2020s, uh, this was a uh, publication and it was a beautiful rendition of the uh, history of coronary artery disease and how well we've done with different interventions. So on this axis is deaths per 100,000 population. And uh, we can see with several interventions when we started bypass surgery and then as bypass surgery improved and then um, in the advent in the uh, 70s and 80s of defibrillators and statin drugs and then other uh, kinds of interventions over time, drug-coded stents in the 2000s. And then we saw with several other in implementation and gene sequencing and risk, strat risk factor stratification, there was a decline in cardiovascular death. However, since then we've seen a plateau and now we're starting to see a rise. And the reason we see a rise is because of uh, obesity, diabetes, sedentary, and we haven't seen any data with the uh, coronavirus yet. So cardiovascular disease burden remains very, very high. This is a messy study, but uh, slide, but just to uh, point out the fact, but heart disease is the leading cause of death for men and women and people of most racial and ethnic groups in the United States. One person dies every 37 seconds of heart disease. About 647,000 Americans die from heart disease each year. That's one in every four deaths. Heart disease costs the United States a huge amount. Coronary artery disease is the most common type of heart disease. Kills 365,000 people per year. This was data from a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, 18.2 8, million adults, 20 and older, have coronary disease, about 6.7%. It's amazingly common. And two out of 10 deaths from coronary disease happen in adults less than 65 years old. So I've just shown you why the heart matters. And now we're going to review some of the uh, biology and why we think of exercise as important. So this is a blood vessel and you can see blood cells, red cells flowing through a blood vessel. This is a cholesterol plaque which grows over time without intervention. This plaque can be vulnerable, it ruptures and a blood clot forms and this causes a sudden blockage of the blood vessel. So our strategy is in, in prevention of vascular disease progression and, and heart attack is to help to prevent this plaque from progressing and to prevent it from rupturing. And physical activity or exercise helps to decrease this inflammation and plaque rupture and vulnerability. It also helps to reduce cholesterols and we've used other medications to reduce cholesterols as well. But exercise is probably the most important feature to prevent this from happening. Now, if you do have an obstruction of blood flow, exercise can help you to induce new vessel formation what we call collateral vessels. So if you exercise for 20 minutes every single day, you can promote new vessel formation and your body can bypass itself. So you can actually improve outcome 
by increasing blood flow as well as plaque stabilization. We use uh, medications like statins uh, to help prevent this plaque progression and also to stabilize the plaque. It also forms an anti-inflammatory effect for the coronary plaque. So we need to address all of these risk factors. And when we're talking about exercise, being fit does not always equate to being healthy. We have to address all of those traditional risk factors. So smoking is still very prevalent and smoking increases inflammation and it makes your uh, blood vessels more likely to clot. So it really accelerates vascular disease. Um, addressing hypertension is important because over time, un, uh, you know, hypertension can be silent. You don't know it, you have it, but over time, the blood vessels get stiffer. And if you don't address hypertension, the heart gets thicker. It has to work harder and it puts more strain on the system. Addressing high cholesterol helps to prevent that plaque formation or the progression that I showed you in the previous slide. Currently, uh, we use genetics as a, a, as a tool to understand risk, and we're more aggressive with people who have strong family histories. There will be genetically targeted therapies, and this is still emerging, and we're doing a lot of work uh, to evaluate what are those genetic risk factors and how do we address them in a much more uh, efficient way. Nutrition, we've spoken about several times, and that's really important. Alcohol, alcohol does decrease energy, mood, it increases empty calories and weight gain. Um, it also decreases motivation, it adds to depression, and it always gets in the way of healthy habits. Um, so that's something uh, important. And alcohol in excess can also be directly toxic to the heart muscle. Caffeine, if you're vulnerable to uh, hypertension, if you're vulnerable to arrhythmia, caffeine can be really important. And so that's something we also always have to address. And in our athletes, we're always looking at other kinds of things uh, that can be you know, stimulants or energy enhancers. And, and there's so many over-the-counter products that you can purchase that have a lot of energy uh, uh, stimulants in them. And uh, some of those can be hidden and you can increase the risk of developing arrhythmias, palpitations, and other kinds of uh, problems. And then obviously the performance enhancing drugs. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, exercise and what we call about the dose response or drug hypothesis. So we know that exercise is good, but can too much exercise be dangerous? So as can be ex expected with any drug, insufficient of the drug will not give you benefit and possibly excessive doses of drugs can cause harm and even death. So this is what we call the dose response curve. So very little exercise, no effect, no response. As you increase the dose of the exercise, you have a, a benefit and then too much you can have death. So this is the therapeutic curve of a drug and this is the toxic effect. So the amount of drug you give, you can have a toxic effect and then the benefit in this area. And we look at uh, exercise in a similar way now. We've been so good at promoting exercise that it, exercise can be a drug and some people exercise excessively. And there's so many extreme sports now that cause uh, excessive demands on the heart. So this is another way of looking at this. If you're looking at exercise training and the volume on this uh, area and that you look at health risk in this, um, in, in this axis, if you're doing no exercise, you're at the highest health risk. The most benefit of exercise is high exercise. However, this new hypothesis that we're looking in the athletic world is the fact that if you increase your exercise beyond or if you have a vulnerability and you exercise beyond your vulnerability, you can actually have risk. We sometimes see this with overheating uh, when, you know, the Boston Marathon at a high uh, temperature. We see this with vulnerabilities. We see this with atrial arrhythmias and other kinds of interventions. So you can have too much of a good thing. 
when we look at what kinds of exercise programs work, uh, this has been studied and we've seen this in uh, rehab programs. When you look at people who have had cardiovascular events and then they entered into a exercise program in a structured fashion, all exercise programs have been shown to decrease mortality and decrease new MI, which is myocardial infarction or heart attack. If you exercise only without modifying other risk factors, you get a benefit in mortality and a benefit in new myocardial infarction. Whereas exercise plus risk factor modifications, uh, the event rate for second or new myocardial infarctions de decreases significantly. So we really want to make sure that we address uh, um, any kind of vulnerability with exercise and programs. This is another study that looked at people, uh, the incidence just of diabetes, which is an independent risk factor for vascular disease and death and to having serious COVID-19 infection. So um, if you were given a placebo, um, you had a much higher incidence of diabetes over time. If you were given a drug that treats diabetes, you still had a stepwise increase of diabetes. But if you had lifestyle intervention alone, there was less incidence. And so this becomes the most important cost-effective and imperative intervention to modify risk. So how do we get people uh, to stick to an exercise program? You know, everyone who's well-intended starts a program and then falls off because human nature is such that we, we are well-intended and then we have difficulty with consistent behaviors. So there's uh, several studies that have looked at uh, commitment contracts. So if you make a contract, for example, with Gym Pact, so if you commit to this contract, you commit, you work out and you earn money. If others who commit don't work out, they pay you. So uh, when we look at people who are committed over time, they have, and this was just looking at healthy food items that were purchased. When you committed to a program, you stuck with it over time. People who were non-committed started off being well-intended and then fell off the program. There's so many studies looking at uh, lifestyle, intensive lifestyle and monitored exercise to improve outcome. This was a particular study that showed improved outcome in people with diabetes. So um, I just want to be leery of time. When we talk about exercise and how we can promote exercise in, the, in, in an environment of, of healthcare and in a physician's environment, we can give exercise prescriptions and there's a mnemonic for that called FIT. So ideally an exercise program should include exercise that improve aerobic fitness, strength and mobility and a basic exercise prescription can be created with this FIT mnemonic. So what is FIT? It's the frequency or the number of days each week that you should exercise, the type of intensity, low, moderate or high intensity, the time of the commitment, so the minutes per session, and then the type of exercise, endurance, strength, mobility, and a combination of such. So the American Heart Association has uh, published a lot of data, and especially during COVID, how do you exercise at home? What are the guidelines? What are the recommendations? So they talk about getting fit in 150 minutes per week. So that's 30 minutes, five days a week, and they want you to get up and move throughout the day. Any activity is better than nothing. Even light intensity activity can offset serious health risks of being sedentary. Intensity of exercise is important. And uh, when we talk about high intensity interval training, most people have seen this uh, uh, acronym of HIT. We look at not only the aerobic benefit of exercise, but it's the only type of exercise that has been shown to slow the aging process. So at a cellular level, you can decrease aging and everyone wants to slow down our aging, I think. 
Exercise also helps to uh, improve muscle tone. You feel better. Physical activity is linked with better sleep, memory, balance, cognitive ability. There's another good one, right? Uh, less risk of weight gain, chronic disease, dementia, depression. And it's one of the most important things you can do for your health. And they promote this very strongly. So the American Heart Association, I spoke about the 150 minutes of moderate activity and they break it down to 30 minutes a day, five days a week. And if you don't have the time, there's the alternative to increase the intensity or the vigor of exercise and doing 75 minutes or 15 minutes a day, five days a week. How do we exercise at home? Well, they've uh, shown a lot of uh, great ideas and we've heard great ideas from our patients. Um, they have a website called heart.org, healthy for good. And they talk about what are the kinds of exercises you can do at home. Um, the cardio exercises, the jumping jacks, squat jumps, jogging, marching in place, stair climbing, uh, strength and stability exercises, planks, side planks, push-ups. And my next slide gives you an example of some of these. So look at these, choose several, do them. Okay, so looking at um, what kinds of exercise are very healthy for you and helpful for you, I think it's important to recognize that um, stretching um, is like walking. So uh, 10 minutes of stretching is similar to walking the length of a football field. I realize I'm using my point on the wrong screen and I apologize about that. Two and a half hours of walking every week for a year is like walking across the state of Wyoming and I don't know Wyoming very well. 30 minutes of exercise uh, with playing singles tennis is like walking a 5K. Um, I like this, 20 minutes of vacuuming is like walking one mile. I'm gonna talk about some other creative uh, and technological kind of tools we can use. And there's what we call apps, um, personal trainer apps that most people have smartphones and they can get onto these apps and download them very easily. So I'm gonna give you some examples of these. So Fitstar uh, is a personal trainer and it asks questions to assess your fitness needs and levels and it uh, devises a program for you. Nike have one which offers more than 100 workouts developed by Nike trainers and, and based on various fitness goals. Swarkit uh, provides body weight workouts five minutes to an hour depending on how much time you have and includes uh, strength, cardiac, yoga, stretching exercises. Uh, Spring BioBeats Pulse recommends music-based. Uh, so, so you can choose your workout based on the kind of music you like. Uh, Mind Body Connect helps you find various fitness classes in your area, such as yoga, Zumba. And then uh, my favorite, the Peloton app, which has been very helpful for me personally. You can be uh, creative and have fun with some of these apps. Uh, the Walk. This you get clues by solving mystery based on number of steps taken. Battle suit runner fitness, you complete military missions as a soldier. Zombies run, maybe this is relevant for now. You earn rewards for every step to save the human race from a zombie attack. Superhero workouts, save the planet by doing crunches and sit-ups. Wouldn't that be nice? Photocracy, which is a social network consisting of exercises of all level. You can scroll through the, the, the activities of friends uh, and you can use uh, news feed for motivation. So um, I like the charity miles because you have to commit to exercise and for every mile of exercise, you earn cash and that can be donated to a charity of your choice. There are daily calorie and activity tracking devices. Uh, My Fitness Pal being one of it, it logs your meals in order to count calories consumed for the day. Noom, uh, very well advertised currently, uh, tracks your daily calories, provides tips for healthier lifestyles and offers uh, 
caloric content of very, uh, you know, various foods that you can get delivered. Healthy Out finds restaurants uh, and can use dietary filters. Um, Shop Well tells you nutrition facts about the items at a grocery store with specific reference to ingredients that you would like to minimize or reduce, such as salt. This is a very interesting uh, company called Whoop. And Whoop is a um, product that you wear on your wrist. It tells you how much strain you have with physical activity and it measures your heart rate. It has a GPS. It can tell you where you go, how long you go, and it actually measures what we call heart rate variability. And that way it can tell you your physical fitness over time. So a lot of athletes are using this. And now recently WHOOP has uh, made some headlines about their ability uh, to create a journal and a uh, stress journal and looking at COVID-19 if you're having any fever. And what's interesting about their ability to track um, your strain and your heart rate variability and your heart rate with activity is that if you do get sick with COVID, your heart rate may increase and this may uh, uh, detect that at an earlier stage. Now, this is the Apple Watch and uh, many of uh, my medical assistants and a lot of younger people have Apple Watches and a lot of my patients are now starting to buy Apple Watches. And one of the uh, attributes of an Apple Watch is if you put your finger on the uh, Apple Watch, you can de develop a heart rhythm strip and over time you can see a rhythm occur and it can tell you what your heart rate is. It can uh, measure your activity, your GPS. You can even make some phone calls while you're doing it, but you can also assess your heart rhythm. Couple of other thoughts. So intent and action. And this is what I talk to my patients about all the time and everyone is well intended and everyone who cannot exercise feel stuck and how do we change that intent and the knowledge and further that to break that barrier and and be active there's so many of my patients who are uh, very knowledgeable and have good intent but they struggle with action and COVID has really created a, a lot of challenge in that regard um, this is another uh, point that I tell my patients, and I'm going to emphasize this, you cannot take care of other people if you're not taking care of yourself. And there are so many people who are in trouble and are struggling, and many of you who are caregivers, stop taking care of yourself. And, and that's a problem because you are shortchanging yourself and you cannot adequately take care of others if you're not doing a good job with yourself. Important to exercise without injury. And this comes up with several of our patient questions. How do we do this? And this is an incredibly important issue. Everyone has fears and doubts about their own ability, their ability to exercise, to be seen in public exercising. And how do we overcome that? How do we make people familiar with taking small steps to improve their strength? looking at what motivates you. So how, what, you know, do you want to live longer? Do you want to have a healthier quality of life? Do you want to get to know your grandchildren? Do you want to be more active and independent? Think about those goals and, and use those to get you moving. So what happens when you're faced with adversity? Do you have the fright or flight? response. So in, in the animal kingdom, a possum acts dead when it's faced with adversity or sudden risk. Other creatures will run away. And that can work for a sudden threat, but this pandemic is ongoing. It's continuously stressful. So we have to adapt. We have to be consistent. Do or do not. There is no try. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to questions from patients that we uh, received earlier. 
and I've looked at these already, so I am going to answer them if I can, and I'd ask any of my panelists to jump in if they want to do that. So the initial question was, I think exercise and its impact to the heart is great. Specifically, how much and what type do I need to do, especially since we're limited on what we can do due to the virus? So this is where I would advise uh, small steps. Overcoming that barrier of inactivity, you know, even if you don't feel up to it, making sure that you can take time out for 10 minutes and perhaps you can increase that while you're exercising to 15 minutes. As I mentioned before, when you exercise consistently for a period, even at a low level of 10 to 15 minutes, you release substances that help to prevent inflammation, protect blood vessel, help with vascular tone, lower blood pressure um, and decrease inflammation. And that helps to decrease the vulnerability. So I think that we have to be creative. I've mentioned some of the uh, creative strategies that of using technology and some of the uh, websites. And I would love to be able to share some of the creative ideas that we've seen from our patients. Um, next question is baby boomers are prone to exercising as if we were still 20. Just quick, can I interrupt you super quick? Absolutely. You turn the heartbeat off because people are finding it distracting. Thank the you. heartbeat. Yeah. That little, they can still hear it? Well, I don't know if they can because I couldn't before, but people were saying they couldn't hear you because of it. So I don't know if when you see it, you can hear it. No, it's not on anymore. Sorry, good. Sorry to interrupt you. Okay. Uh, uh, this is just the heart beating without any sound. Um, so baby boomers are prone to exercising as if we're still 20. Uh, this is something that I really uh, promote very strongly is this idea of exercise without injury and the importance of such because if you do injure yourself, you uh, negate all the benefit of exercise. What we call the weekend warrior syndrome is when people don't exercise very much and then they try make up for lost time and then they're much more vulnerable to injury, strain or even heart disease because of the inflammatory response and the demand and the stress and the strain of sudden activity. So my recommendation is always to start off slow, be kind to yourself, be consistent with the exercise program, sustain it and increase it gradually over time. And that's where uh, some of us can help you by giving you an exercise prescription. Um, this one, I, I guess I had to include. What do you, I do for exercise? What do we do? Um, and this was a real struggle for me personally when uh, the gyms closed. I am someone who exercises uh, pretty much every day. I don't feel good if I don't exercise. And at the time of COVID, I um, bought myself a uh, home exercise bicycle. I used to play squash six, seven days a week. Um, and I used to do spin classes. So I got myself a bicycle and uh, together with my uh, colleague, Dr. Allison Kelly Hedgepeth, we uh, join each other on Peloton classes. And it was amazing to me to see how many physician groups there are on Peloton, working from home, uh, exercising the importance in uh, decreasing risk and helping with burnout. So um, I can't wait to play squash again. I am struggling with this concept of still being exercising in isolation and not playing sport. But I'm hanging in there and uh, it, it's, uh, you know, the having an, an environment that you can exercise and uh, be involved with music or a group or a social group, even if, if it's virtual, has been incredibly helpful from my perspective. So uh, how to begin exercising when you're out of shape and everything hurts? Uh, what, what should we do? And again, I'll, I, I won't repeat myself other than to say start off slow, be consistent and uh, conscientious. Um, bone health, exercise and diet, though I guess this doesn't fall under heart health. And absolutely it falls under heart health. Um, we talk about osteopen osteopenia, which is bone density. As we get older, uh, we lo lose bone mass, but we also lose muscle mass uh, together with this, what we call sarcopenia. And uh, 
bone density and muscle tone is incredibly important because if you improve your muscle mass and your muscle tone, not only do you improve your physiologic metabolism of glucose and energy sources, but you get stronger, you're less likely to fall because your co coordination improves. And if you do fall, you're less likely to break something or hurt yourself. So bone health is incredibly important. Exercise is incredibly important. And low resistance types of exercise also help improve bone density and muscle tone. Next question, uh, how much or target zones for heart health and also for lowering cholesterol? So this is really a, something that uh, for this audience, and I don't know, um, you know, the range of age and uh, uh, people's um, ability to exercise and, and what your goals for exercise are. But um, this is important across the, the gamut of uh, athletes and uh, recreational uh, exercises. Um, so we can predict this based on um, age, based on heart rate expectation. Um, it, the target, uh, in fact, when we do a cardiopulmonary stress test, we can actually very accu accurately assess this. The problem here is when people are on medications or if they have a slower than normal heart rate uh, and that, that's a, something we can individualize uh, and get people to target heart rate. But generally what we're trying to assess is get people to an anaerobic threshold uh, for exercise training, which is where your heart rate is uh, at a point at which you're not um, producing more carbon dioxide than you're using, utilizing oxygen, what we call an anaerobic threshold. And if you can train at a level or a zone beneath that, I, I don't want to get too technical, but uh, when we meet with our patients on an individual basis, we can assess that and give some uh, personal guidance. Next question was natural ways to maintain good level of cholesterol and blood pressure with exercise and diet for those of us who don't need to lose weight. So, you know, I have many patients who are skinny with significant risk factor. Uh, and, um, you know, you, you can be very thin and you can have awful genes with uh, and, and high risk factors. So what we do know about exercise and cholesterol is that it lowers your total cholesterol, it lowers triglycerides, it improves the good cholesterol, the HDL. And hopefully when people are making healthier choices with exercise, they're also making healthier choices with food. Um, the other thing about blood pressure, I would just mention very quickly is that, um, as I mentioned before, when you're exercising regularly, you decrease vascular resistance, uh, you improve vascular tone. So people who have labile hypertension or blood pressure responses that increase with stress, you can modulate that with physical activity. And in fact, over time, you can make it much easier to treat uh, and lower doses of medications when you uh, are exercising regularly. And oftentimes you can, uh, for many people, actually treat blood pressure with lifestyle intervention. So that's nutrition and exercise as a combination. Um, stretches or exercises that are practical to do at home and uh, more about the warning signs of heart disease. So, um, as I mentioned before, stretching is really important. It helps with muscle tone, it helps to prevent injury, but it also uh, helps with, aer with aerobic fitness. So, exercise uh, helps with balance. So, stretching helps with balance, tai chi, things like that also help with balance, helps with proprioception, so you're much less likely to fall or injure yourself. Um, and there's, uh, you know, I'm not going to go through this now, but there's so much information on the American Heart Association website, and we will also post some to our website about uh, more practical uh, uh, things you can do from the home. And perhaps we'll also share some of the uh, great kind of creative ideas that we've heard from uh, some of our patients. And uh, in a time of COVID and, and isolation, uh, um, you know, being creative and, and one of the things I always tell my patients if, if you can, is to dance. And so find a partner, steady each other, uh, you know, close the shades so the neighbors don't have to see you, turn the music up and dance, keep steady and actually enjoy it. And when I do introduce that as an option, oftentimes my patients will smile. So I know not only are they 
thinking about it, but they, they have a level of uh, humor related to that. So those are two positive uh, um, things to do. What are the warning signs of heart disease? So this is something I wanted to address quickly. And, and when you are on a regular exercise program, you get to know what your body is like. You know, if there's a change in your ability to do some, something and you're used to doing it, that's a warning sign that something's different. So people who don't do any exercise and then suddenly try to exert themselves, they will feel out of breath. They will feel fit, fatigued, especially walking up the stairs. And that's when we get the calls of, uh, you know, doctor, I'm feeling very out of breath walking up the stairs. And, you know, so when did you last uh, do this? When, uh, you know, how often are you exercising? So uh, walking up the stairs, for example, is an anaerobic uh, effort. So you're carrying your body weight up against gravity. Most people will feel breathless. And if you're not conditioned to do so, you will feel uh, out of breath. So if you have an exercise program, for example, if you go for a walk for 20 minutes, five days a week, or 30 minutes, as it suggests in American Heart Association guidelines, any change in your ability to exercise is important to recognize. So many people have those traditional warn warning factors of uh, chest discomfort, tightening in the chest. Some people don't have those warning systems. Uh, symptoms. They'll feel out of breath. They'll have joy, indigestion, anything that you feel that is different that you can provoke with exercise. Because remember, when you are exercising, you're increasing your heart rate. You're increasing the squeeze of the heart muscle. So the demand for oxygenated blood increases. So if there's a supply demand mismatch or you're not getting enough blood flow to the heart muscle, you won't feel like you can achieve the same exercise that you can do. So not only are you protecting yourself with regular aerobic exercise, but you're also, it serves as an early warning system. So if your ability to exercise changes, that's an important uh, sign. So uh, before I hand over to uh, Dr. Lewis to uh, um, address some of the questions. Uh, I wanted to leave you with this. this, the C's. Be cautious, be conscientious, be consistent. And please show compassion. This is a difficult time for all of us. Vulnerabilities and risk factors are strongly related to bad outcome from COVID-19. We can address this. So uh, I'm gonna leave this slide up which is an advertisement for next week's session. I hope you enjoyed this week's one. It will be available to you. And I will uh, hand over to Dr. Lewis. I'm actually gonna hand it over again to Dr. Kelly Hedgepath. I just wanna draw attention to the chat. I put in also a number of other highly recommended senior focused exercises from some of my patients. Um, but Allison, I will let you take the floor. That was a wonderful talk, Dr. Bilchek, and I feel so inspired to be planning my next workout and to get out there. And it's really so lovely, too, to see everybody's responses in the Q&A sharing their apps. So um, in the survey that goes out following this lecture, I would encourage everybody, if they want to share that additional information, we would love um, to share, if you're willing, some of the tips that you've used and we'll be collecting that. So feel free to enter that into our survey. Uh, Dr. Bilchek, there are a number of questions and we only have a few minutes, but maybe we can try to hit some of them. Um, a couple more questions on how best to really gauge the intensity that you're working out, especially if you're not able to follow your heart rate. Any um, practical cues for us to follow? Yeah, so, you know, in this age of technology, uh, it's almost um, uh, liberating not to check your heart rate, not to be kind of uh, conditioned to do activity based on your heart rate. So it really depends what your goals are. I, I would say the first thing I would uh, suggest is don't worry about your heart rate. Just get moving and keep moving. Don't obsess with it. If you're training for an event 
or you're concerned about your heart rate or you're not feeling well, let us help you to assess that uh, in, a, in an environment where we can check what, what your heart rate response is to exercise. Um, but so many of my patients obsess with their heart rates to a point where they're afraid to exercise. So you, you, I think of exercise as an ability to switch your mind off from the rest of the world, to get out there uh, and do something without watching your heart rate. So in fact, when I'm doing my bicycle um, uh, spin classes, I've turned off the heart rate. I just want to work hard. I want to listen to the music and I want to enjoy myself and not obsess with that. So I think that that's for, for a, you know, a strategy. I, what do you think, Alison? Do you uh, check your heart rate? Dara, do you check yours? So I uh, do monitor my heart rate, um, but only because I really uh, love the data and, and follow as many metrics as possible, which makes me a science geek. Um, I will say when I give an exercise prescription to my patients, I usually use a scale of zero to 10. So zero being sitting, and 10 being sprinting for the bus. I really like you exercising in a workload that's sustainable and avoids injury. So that's usually somewhere between a four or a six so that you can maintain that for 20 to 30 minutes uh, at a time. But there's no uh, only way to do things. And the more that you're in touch with your body, I think it's easier you know, as, as you get more facile with your exercise regimen to know what's normal for you um, and to gauge uh, how you're feeling. Dr. Lee Lewis, any other thoughts? Yeah, no, I um, I am not a heart rate follower. I do track my steps and I track my sleep, but everyone's heart rate is also different because as you all have probably noticed, when you're really out of shape and you just walk across the room, your heart rate might go up a lot. That doesn't mean that's good. It just means you're out of shape. So a better gauge of how hard you're working is your perceived subjective level of exertion. If you can sing at the top of your lungs, you're not working hard enough. Yeah, no, so that's that's interesting. And, um, you know, there's different zones of exercise. So when you're training in zone one, which is kind of a recovery phase, it's something you could do for hours at a time. Um, zone three, you can do perhaps for an hour at a time. And the zone five, which is kind of anaerobic you can potentially do for five to ten minutes um, and that's the the most you can do um, I would say that um, about five years ago I used to tell people don't monitor your heart rates because the devices weren't very accurate and they caused a lot of phone calls to the office when um, people would be on a gym machine and their heart rates would be uh, 160 and they haven't even started on the exercise program and so there's a lot of variability there but now that the uh, technology has improved to a point where there's some accuracy especially when there's EKG driven stuff like the Apple Watch uh, the, the data is much better um, and some of these devices are very expensive. Um, so it all depends on what your aim is and what your goal is and what you're training for. Um, but that's why I was talking about the importance of being consistent. Know what your body feels like in a consistent basis. And as you increase it, if it feels abnormal to you, you know, certainly a heart rate is an important metric to, to evaluate. Well, Sadly, I think we are out of time today, and there are a number of questions um, that we haven't gotten to. So I think we'll make an attempt to answer some of these and include them um, in an email out to everybody. The survey will go out, and then we'll be continuing with our exercise discussion next week as Dr. Breslow joins us to talk about sports medicine. Yeah, I, I strongly advise you uh, come to that if you're interested in uh, endurance uh, athleticism. She's published uh, nationally and globally on uh, sports medicine and she's, uh, you know, very involved in the, in the community. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, and have a great week. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye, everyone.